Raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances wait on nature's mischief. Come thick night and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold! This soliloquy from Lady Macbeth comes from the exposition of the play. It follows her reading Macbeth's letter where he explains his encounter with the weird sisters in which they proclaim his prophecy. Here we see her dark and venomous mind as she declares her wish to end Duncan's rule for the progression of her beloved husband. Birds throughout Macbeth appear as signals of terrible events. For example, in Act Two, Scene Four, as Lady Macbeth waits for her husband to murder Duncan, she hears the screech of an owl and yells, hark, peace, where it can be inferred that this screech is the announcement of Duncan's death, and that Macbeth has done the deed. In another occurrence, after Banquo's ghost first appears, if charnel houses and our graves must send, those that we bury back, our monuments, shall be the moths of kites, from Act 3, Scene 4. Since a charnel house is where skeletal remains are stored, kites, which are hawks and their maws, the mouth, throat or gall of an animal, are in reference to most likely the old fear of people not being properly buried will be devoured clean by such birds. Because Macbeth is paranoid due to these killings, he'd rather that no trace of his victims' bodies ever come out of their graves in any way. With that said, the presence of a raven isn't any different to these instances and referenced references just mentioned. The raven, which is known to be a mediator animal between life and death, an ill omen and a symbol of unkindness and conspiracy, it is also associated with Apollo, who, aside from being popularly known as the god of the sun, is also the god of prophecy and is the messenger of the mortal world. It can be interpreted in this context that the raven, the one who croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan, is ironic as it is associated with the god of the sun, music, poetry, medicine, etc., and everything enjoyable in that sense. But yet the raven is proclaiming death. With the raven serving as the messenger that Duncan's death is for certain at this point, it's being unkind and a conspirator, which ties perfectly with Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's plans to be king and queen, is the perfect entrance to Lady Macbeth's soliloquy. So throughout this soliloquy, Lady Macbeth is revealing the wishes, revealing her wishes by what she's asking the spirits to do for her. So she begins by beckoning the spirits to her, saying, Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, calling said fatal spirits to aid her in her mission. The first thing that she asks of the spirits is to unsex her. So she's asking them to remove her from her womanhood and instead to fill her from crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. So by asking to be filled instead of from head to toe, she's asking to be filled from the crown of her head, which is alluding to the fact that the murder of Duncan will then lead to her becoming the queen. Um, and direst cruelty is refu ugh, sorry, refers to her wish to be filled with brutality. So she's asking the spirits to make her vicious and to make her capable of being able to commit this murder. Um, by calling upon the spirit, she's showing that she herself doesn't feel like she is ready and instead she needs the aid of someone else, the spirits, to be able to help her to carry out this task. She then says, make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse, which creates a metaphor to a stink's venom, thickening up the blood of its victim. So here she's requesting an, an inhuman change within herself. 
<laughs> she'd like the pathways of remorse and guilt to be blocked up so that she'll be incapable of regretting the murder that she is intending to commit, which she's revealing by asking the spirits to do this for her. She wishes that no compunctious visiting of nature shake her fell purpose, meaning that she wishes, sorry, meaning that she wishes that no feelings of guilt or remorse or moral qualms will shake her in her quest to commit the act that's inhumanely cruel. She also asks that the spirits take her milk for gall, which, are further, which is further promoting her wish to be unsexed. So she's asking that she be removed from womanhood and instead be able to be this kind of angry, brutal character. Um, to remove her milk for gall would be to replace her nourishing qualities for those of bitterness. So her milk, obviously coming from her breast like a mother, and then gall is just referring to anything that's bitter or harsh. So she's essentially asking the spirits to fill her with some sort of acidic anger instead of the sweetness and compassion that would generally be found in that of a woman. Lady, Macb Lady Macbeth's call to the spirits revolves around her wishes to change into a different person and to gain or exchange qualities within herself that she sees making her unfit to commit the murder of Duncan. Lady Macbeth doesn't feel that she as a woman or a person is yet fit to be able to, cap to be capable of murder. And thus, that's why she's calling upon these spirits to be able to fill her with venom and bitterness so that she can become more powerful and in turn, murder Duncan. When Lady Macbeth says, come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, she is stating her belief that being a woman, a bringer of life, interferes with the act of murder. This idea is repeated in the rest of the play. For example, it occurs in another Lady Macbeth line, when you durst do it, then you were a man. This line insinuates that Macbeth would be less of a man if he were unable to kill. And again, near the end of the play, Ross says that Seward's son died like a man on the battlefield. In this play, murder is a thoroughly masculine activity. Murders are committed again and again by male characters, by Macbeth, soldiers, Macduff, actual murderers by occupation, etc. Mm -hmm. Female killing isn't the norm. However, throughout this monologue, Lady Macbeth works herself into a frenzy, calling upon supernatural spirits and murderous ministers to transform her into someone capable of doing the deed. This emphasizes two things. Firstly, it is so fundamentally unnatural for Lady Macbeth to kill, she requires otherworldly assistance. She desperately needs her milk to be replaced with bile, her passage to remorse stopped up, and her blood thickened. Secondly, this, this emphasizes that Lady Macbeth actually possesses the insane courage and desire to actually call upon supernatural spirits, and she is immensely capable of such an extreme action like this. To sum up, Lady Macbeth's character is one of paradoxical power. Her ability to murder is restrained by her gender, However, her will to kill is unrestrained and vicious. In this way, Lady Macbeth is, at the is as the witches say, fair is foul and foul is fair. In addition, Lady Macbeth's tone is filled with venom as she lists her demands to the spirits. Through a bite from a snake or her own tone, venom can literally coagulate and make thick her blood. The snake is the biblical, the biblical symbol of evil, a serpent is the one to tempt Eve in the Garden of Eden. Looking at Lady Macbeth as this serpent, we see the irony that instead of the snake tempting the woman, it's the snake tempting the man, Macbeth, to sin. Lady Macbeth asks for thick night and the dunnest smoke of hell to cover her thoughts and actions from heaven, which may tell her to hold, hold in the final line. This is another example of her hellish action. In conclusion, Lady Macbeth wants nothing to stand between her and her mission of killing Duncan, including God and the heavens. In this way, she is much like her husband. Both parties will do whatever it takes to gain more power, but as a result of their unyielding ambition, Lady Macbeth and her husband both fall due to their past sins.